Uh, hi, everyone. Um, yes, my name is Jan Meyer. I'm working with the, uh, the European Youth Forum, which is the umbrella organization of youth organizations in, in Europe. Uh, we have 107 members uh, all across Europe. And what we essentially do, so I'm working with the Secretariat, is that we consult with the members and then advocate their opinions towards the EU institutions, but also the Council of Europe and the UN. Um, all right. So um, this session is about markets, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to speak about markets, or rather the institution of the markets. And in particular, what is the role of social NGOs, environmental NGOs, activists, and policymakers uh, in this all? But first, I, I want to take a, a step back. And um, so my title is actually Senior uh, Policy Officer for Sustainable Development that was given to me. I'm not a big fan of the term, to be honest, because I think uh, these days it means everything and nothing, which makes it very, very difficult uh, to talk about it. But I think this is this is a, a, a picture you're all familiar with. Um, so it's a Venn diagram depicting sustainable development as uh, the interaction between the social, uh, uh, the environment, and and the economy. And um, I think this uh, uh, has been misleading uh, in some ways because what I hear a lot from our member organisations and uh, from other civil society organisations in uh, in Brussels is that they go to the European institutions and they essentially say, okay, we want you to do more of the social, we want you to do more of the environmental and less of the economic. Um, so uh, I understand where this is coming from, but we at the European Youth Forum have taken a bit of a different approach. Um, and this is from a, a policy paper uh, we developed together with our members, uh, I think about two years ago. So if you're interested, you can download it on our website. Uh, if you just type in uh, Youth Forum Policy Papers, Sustainable Development. And basically we did this uh, by, by consulting with the members and, and the in the first step, figuring out, okay, where, where are the problems these days? And then in the second step, we, we group these, these problems. And the first thing is obviously our environmental crisis. And Thierry talked about this. Uh, the climate crisis, plastic pollution, air pollution, uh, water pollution, and, and all these things. Um, a second uh, big, big theme is our social and economic crisis. So also Terry talked about this. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but uh, here as the main thing, uh, rising inequalities, uh, gender inequality, um, and so on. Um, we also identified a, a, a third category, which is uh, what we call the a values crisis. Um, so you can see uh, in surveys, actually, that people are feeling more and more lonely these days, that um, there is uh, uh, trust and uh, social cohesion in society and negative trends there. Um, and then last, but, but certainly not least, uh, a democratic crisis, which is related to, to shrinking civic space, uh, but also, for instance, the rise of, of nationalist parties uh, uh, all over Europe. And so essentially what we did in the policy paper is to um, uh, try to dig down uh, and look at these things as symptoms rather than problems in itself and really try to identify uh, the root causes of all of these things. And um, what you are arriving at is, is uh, an economic system that values profit and growth more than uh, people and planet. So I would add to, to Thierry that it's really all about people. I agree with that, but it's also all about uh, the environment. Um, so this is my key message. My, my first uh, key message is that we must stop pretending that these dimensions of sustainable development, so the social, the environmental, and the economic are somehow separate um, because we can only address them, uh, the, the social problems, and the environmental problems, if we work on the economy. So we must work together as civil society, as progressive policymakers, as activists, and as anyone who's an interest in, in, in creating a better society to question the logic of our underlying economic system uh, and change it. So uh, here's the next problem. What do we actually mean by our economic system? And it's not that easy, right? But uh, I think there are three key characteristics that describe our uh, uh, current economic system. And the first one is its goal, which is, um, well, growth on a macro level. So if you're looking at government agendas all across Europe, the main thing they want to uh, achieve is, is GDP growth and then everything 
uh, other is is secondary or subordinated to that. And it, it's the same on a on a on a company level. So corporations are primarily set up to um, to 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 grow to produce a a profit. The second thing is is ownership, and in our system, the ownership is predominantly private, and not only of property but of the means of production. And what follows from that is that there is a distinction between uh, the owners of capital or uh, you know of a company, so the employers and employees, and there uh, are other models, of course, like cooperatives, where distinction uh, this distinction doesn't exist. So in a cooperative, the um, the, the workers are essentially the owners of the company. Um, and then a third thing, and this is what I'm going to talk a bit more uh, in this presentation, is is markets and um, the institution of the market, um, which in, in in our economic system more and more is um, yeah the primary form of economic relations. So um, the idea of the market, where does this all come from? Um, well, obviously there existed markets before Adam Smith, but I think he was the first one to actually put a name on this. And he described the market as an invisible hand that um, can mobilize, diffuse information about people's wants and the cost of meeting them and thereby, and that's where the invisible hand comes into play, uh, coordinate billions of buyers and sellers through a global system of prices. Um, and this is essentially the argument that uh, neoliberals and, 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 and proponents of the uh, uh, a more free market, you should say, because the market is never actually 100% free or unregulated. Um, this is what they would say, that uh, the market is an extremely powerful tool because of precisely this invisible hand, this distribution efficiency. And then, you know, um, you could make the argument that if you look at centrally planned economies and you see the picture here on the right hand side, uh, in the Soviet Union, like, you know, to avoid these, these queues and to essentially meet the needs of people, uh, the market uh, is, is a very useful institution to do that. And there is a great deal of truth in that. Um, but what's also true is that um, not the market, but the introduction of more and more markets leads to, to, to a certain number of caveats. And I think if you take one thing away from this presentation, it should be this, this sentence. Uh, that the market only values what is priced and only delivers to those who can pay, because I think this is very essential. And what follows from that is, um, well, sort of downsides in, in, in three areas that I'm going to quickly talk about. The first one is environmental harm. The second one uh, is what you could call uh, uh, a change in values or a crisis in values. And the third one, and that seems to be a theme today, uh, is, is inequality. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the environmental dimension because that's also going to be covered by Cathy in the presentation right after this one. Um, but here the problem is that the market doesn't account for what economists call environmental externalities. So these are basically the costs uh, that have to be paid by, um, by people who are not directly involved in the transaction, right? So by innocent bystanders in future generations. So I just put a picture here and you can actually get you know, flights these days for as little as, as five euros with Ryanair. And you might ask yourself, okay, why is this the case? Now, it's not actually that these flights are so cheap. Um, they have costs to the environment that have to be paid, but just not by the one who's buying these flights, but by people in the global south, for instance, who are already suffering uh, from the consequences of climate change. And obviously future generations who will suffer uh, much, much more if we don't stop this trend. Um, the second one is um, related to, to values, the second caveat. And there is a, a Harvard professor called uh, Michael Sandel who has uh, uh, been doing great work on this. So this is one of his books, uh, um, What Money Can't Buy on the Moral Limits of Markets. And well, he basically makes the argument that there are fewer and fewer things we can't buy. So what he actually calls that is that we've moved from market economy to a market uh, society where everything is up uh, for sale. And here are just a few examples uh, from the book. So you can now um, sort of rent a, a, an Indiga, Indian surrogate mother for 8,000 8, euros, and you can even um, buy the right to shoot an endangered uh, animal, a black rhino, for 250,000 euros in, in South Africa. And it also works the other way around. So he, he brings a, a quite funny example, I think, that you can, or there was one case where a mother to pay for the uh, tuition of uh, her son's uh, college um, 
actually rented out her uh, a space on the forehead so she got a tattoo of an online casino and um yeah was paid uh two thousand dollars for that and what is also interesting he has other examples on on you know how these um how the introduction of markets or monetary incentive which is essentially the same thing uh changes um our behavior so he has the example for instance of uh, of a school where um uh, pupils are being paid two dollars for every book they that, that they read and what was the consequence of that is that they read very very short books uh, but more of them but once the 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 money incentive was not there anymore uh, people stopped uh, reading books all together because here is the key thing that the money incentive doesn't trigger uh, or, or doesn't you know sort of play into the intrinsic value that these these things have so uh, to sum, sum up the second caveat is that um, well my market triumphalism um, or uh, yeah the introduction of more and more markets uh, in our society has led to these markets values penetrate spheres of our social life that are morally questionable and generally made our society uh, more materialistic and then you know as a follow-up from that uh, the third caveat is that um, increasingly this also applies to our fundamental needs when you know these these commodities that we all need to survive are being traded on the market so uh, i'm sure you've heard of um, you know the consequences of uh, food stocks uh, for for instance, for for uh, growers in the in the global south, and you know the prices being very volatile, um, a big debate about the the privatization of of water uh, as well. And then, if you thought there was one thing where it's really hard to introduce artificial scarcity, which is uh, the air we breathe now, uh, as you can see on the right hand side, uh, there are actually oxygen bars where you can go in and buy a can of air. Now, why does this matter? It matters because the more money determines our access to fundamental necessities, the more inequality matters, right? The more it matters to be poor. So if money would only be to buy luxury products, it wouldn't matter all that much. But since markets um, are in, in every aspect of our, uh, of our life now, including those fundamental needs, inequality matters much, much more. So um, here's my conclusion. So on the right hand side, you can actually see a, a, a picture of um, Kate Roberts' book, Donut Economics, that was uh, sort of the basis, I think, for, for this conference as well. And he speaks of the market as embedded. And I think that's a very you know, useful uh, uh, term to use here. So um, what she actually does is she compares the market to higher um, and there are pros and cons uh, of the market I think you've seen that in the presentation and she compares it she uses that metaphor of fire because um, the market is an extremely useful tool it can be an extremely useful tool such as fire but once it gets out of control once it gets into all these other spheres obviously it can have very damaging effects like fire literally burning down uh, our social values and our environment so um my conclusion for that is that um, it's not like currently we're not really talking about the role of markets in our society uh, as far as uh, a civil society uh, is concerned and um, it is really really important that we do that so uh, thanks again to Martin and the whole COFAS team to to organizing this and yeah very much looking forward to having that debate and the Q&A right after this thanks very much <laughs>